Welcome to Statics Lab. This instructional video is designed to orient you to the overall logistics of the lab portion of statics, as well as to describe and review some of the foundational aspects of this lab that you are expected to understand and use on a weekly basis. A unique portion of the statics course here at DU is this novel series of hands-on experiments that have been developed to allow you to test the theoretical aspects of the course that will be covered in the lecture portion in a hands-on experimental setting. Within this lab series, there are a total of five labs that will cover the major concepts in statics. Lab 1 will cover particle equilibrium, Lab 2 will cover two-dimensional moments, Lab 3 will be on centroids, Lab 4 will be a truss design competition, and Lab 5 will cover internal forces. As you can see, all of the experimental lab sessions fall on the even weeks throughout the quarter, and it's important to note that each lab is worth 5% of your overall course grade, and so this lab can either significantly help or hurt your overall grade based on how you perform. In order to adequately prepare you for each experimental session, each lab will consist of a lab prep session that will occur in the preceding week, which falls on the odd weeks throughout the quarter. There are three main lab deliverables that will contribute to your overall grade for each experiment. The first is a pre-lab assignment, and this will be assigned during every lab prep session, and it will be due during the respective experimental session for that experiment and it will be worth 20% of your overall grade for that respective experiment. The second is the experimental session. Each lab will consist of its respective experimental session that falls on the even weeks in the quarter, in which you are responsible for collecting all of the data that is required to satisfy the objective of that lab assignment. And if you're unable to finish collecting this data for some reason, it's your responsibility to complete this within the designated lab office hours. Attendance is absolutely mandatory for the experimental session, and if you have an excused absence or you're unable to attend the experimental session, this needs to be discussed prior to that absence with the course or lab instructor. Any unexcused absences will result in a zero for the assignment. The third and final deliverable is the lab memo report. All labs will be graded based on this written two pages of text memo report that will result in 80% of your total lab grade for that specific experiment. And don't let this length fool you. It's often more work to write in such a limited space because the content must be quality. And each memo will consist of four sections, the intro, the methods, the results, and the discussion and the conclusion. And there are specific instructions, as well as a sample memo, that are posted in Canvas under the Files tab within the Lab Documents folder. And please note that there is a sample memo Word document that is posted and is editable for you and so I strongly encourage that you use this as your format for all lab reports. And this format will be used in the majority of your experimental labs moving forward in your coursework, specifically in Dynamics 1 and Dynamics 2. All four of the sections of the memo report will be graded independently from one another, and grading rubrics will be posted on Canvas for each lab assignment, but here I will briefly discuss the overall purpose and what should be included within each section of the memo report. And this information can be found in more detail in the memo report instructions document that's posted in Canvas. So the overall purpose of the intro is to clearly describe the main topic and the objective of the experiment that you are performing to the reader. And to do this, you must be able to include the relevant background info regarding the experiment that you're performing. And so in other words, why should we even care about this topic? And why is this even brought up in the lecture course as a concept within statics? Because this is an experiment, don't forget to include your hypothesis that you should make before you begin your experiment. And recall that what constitutes a proper hypothesis is that it is both testable and falsifiable. And you're not graded on the overall accuracy or correctness of your hypothesis, but rather your interpretation of why or why not your hypothesis was correct. And just as a hint of advice, because the memo report is limited to two pages, I recommend limiting the intro section to just one paragraph. The second section within the memo report is the methods, and this is usually the easiest for engineers to write because it's so linear, and it's designed to clearly explain all of the steps that were performed during the experiment. A good way to assess the quality of your methods section, and also is how we grade these sections, is to ask yourself if somebody who knows nothing about this lab, could they reproduce this experiment? Now this doesn't apply to every single person, but rather we have to assume that we are writing to knowledgeable engineers. So therefore, be careful of including extra details that's not necessary because the space is so limited. For example, if we consider these two sentences that are describing the same step. The first says, 
Three strings were tied together and then three separate masses were hung from those strings off of pulleys. The second being, three masses of different magnitudes were configured in an equilibrium position and it references figure one. The second is much more concise and uses a figure to your advantage. The third section within the memo is the results section, and this is designed to highlight the main quantitative findings of your experiment within your text. And quantitative is emphasized here because we are engineers and this is how we communicate these unbiased results. For example, it's no longer appropriate to say something like, the analytic and experimental results were close. People may ask, well, how close is close? Rather, we can describe this using quantitative findings and could say something like the average percent difference between the analytic and experimental results was 7.6%. It's okay to place some results within a table that's in the results section. However, make sure you place all of your figures in an appendix that's after the two-page limit that can be referenced within your text. And this is just because figures are so big and the two-page limit is so concise. Now with that in mind, it's not okay for your results section to be one sentence long and say something like, the results are found in the appendix. You still need to highlight the main findings, the main quantitative findings within your text. The fourth and final section is the discussion, and this is designed for you to interpret and discuss the meanings of your results. And to guide you with this, each lab assignment has a list of assigned discussion questions that cover the main fundamentals of that specific experiment. But be sure as you're answering these questions that the overall theme of the discussion should tie back into what was the main objective of this experiment. In other words, answer again why was this experiment even done and why are your results relevant in statics. And if you get some unexpected results that don't support your initial hypothesis, that's fine as long as you make sure that you explain what happened, explain what factors contributed to what went wrong or what was unexpected. As I said earlier, there's also an appendix section that can be used and is in addition to the two-page text limit of the memo report. And the appendix is designed for all of the extra stuff, like figures and tables and equations, etc., that's needed within your memo report. But make sure that if you put anything in the appendix, it needs to be referenced within your text. You need to tell the reader to go look in the appendix for what you're referencing. The final thing to consider when writing your memo report is that formatting will be a small portion of your overall grade. And these formatting items include, you need to make sure that all tables and figures are properly labeled. And in accordance to the APA formatting instructions, table captions go above the table and figure captions go below the table. Make sure that your memo is legible in grayscale or black and white, and this primarily applies to your figures. And so make sure that you're using different line weights or different line types, different symbols and such, so that if it's printed in black and white, the reader can still interpret them. And finally, make sure that all of your graphs have proper axes labels with the appropriate units that are used. For submission, you will write one report per group, and you will submit only one report per lab group. Each memo report will be due at exactly 5 p.m. on the following Monday after the experimental session. And all of these dates will be indicated in your course schedule that you were given, as well as on the syllabus posted on Canvas, and it will be well communicated to you. And for every day late, which begins at 5.01 p.m. on the Monday that it is due, five points will be deducted each day, and it will not be accepted after three days. And finally, all of the memo reports will be submitted as PDFs, on Canvas and it will go through turnitin.com. And so based on the course policy, any form of cheating that shows up on lab reports will result in an overall F for the course. So now that we've covered the basic logistics of the lab portion of the course, let's go over some of the basic fundamentals that we will encounter within the experimental session. And the first being experimental variability. In class, when we're solving statics problems, we are solving for what is known as the analytic or exact solution. However, as we know, in the real world, there's variability everywhere, which comes from a variety of sources that include material variability, tolerance, measurement variability, environmental variability, and so on and so on. And so as stated earlier, one of the novel components of this lab is that we can be testing these analytic solutions that we solve for in class in an experimental setting. And because experiments are pretty messy, we will encounter a wide variety of variability within this lab. Within this lab, there are three primary sources of variability or uncertainty that we will encounter. And the first is a systematic error, which occurs repeatedly every single time a measurement is made. And this usually occurs because of a miscalibration of a device, a primary physical assumption has been ignored, such as there is no friction within the system, 
or an inaccurate measurement. And it's your responsibility to be able to identify if you have made a systematic error that can be co corrected that will affect your results. The second source of error, which is probably the most common that we will encounter within this lab, is instrumental uncertainty. And this is limited to the precision in which a physical quantity can be made and is dependent on the type of instrument. And so in this lab, the majority of measuring devices we use are all analog and therefore are limited to their precision. The third and final form of variability that we may encounter in this lab is statistical errors. And this results in variability across measurements due to a number of different physical factors that could confound the results. And for example, as the atmospheric pressure changes day to day, it could affect a variety of different readings that are also taken across different days. Because these experiments are messy and there will be a lot of variability that we encounter, we need to be able to accurately and honestly represent this variability. And so to do this, we use mean and standard deviation that is taken across multiple measurements. And so therefore, every measurement that is taken in this lab must be taken multiple times and all of your results will include a mean and standard deviation of those readings. So the last foundational component of this lab that we need to cover comes with the accurate representation of significant figures. And as we know, these can have a large impact on how you present your results. And therefore, you will be expected to and will be graded on maintaining the correct number of significant figures within your reports. And so let's review how we are going to correctly account for all of the significant figures. When measuring from analog devices that are used in this class, such as rulers or protractors, the rule of thumb is to represent all of the data one decimal place past the highest measurement resolution of that device. For example, the rulers that we use in this lab are accurate to the tenth of a centimeter or a millimeter. So for example, consider this reading where the red arrow falls between 2.7 and 2.8 centimeters. So therefore, we will report this to three significant figures or 2.76 centimeters. So once we measure and collect all of our data with the correct significant figures, we must maintain that throughout all of the analyses that are required. And so as a reminder, all non-zero digits are significant, and all zeros are significant except when they precede the decimal point or when they follow the decimal and precede the first non-zero digit. So in order to determine significant figures for numbers with a decimal place, the rule of thumb is to start on the first non-zero digit and stop at the last digit. And so consider the value that is read of 0 0.0508000. So if we begin at the first non-zero digit, which is 5, and end at the last digit, regardless of if it's 0 or non-zero, the significant figures are 508000. For numbers without a decimal place, it's a little more straightforward. In order to determine the significant digits for that number, the rule of thumb is to start and stop on the first and last non-zero digits. So for example, consider the number 2,500. If we start and stop on the first and last non-zero digits, the numbers between the 2 and 5 are all significant, even including those zeros. This is just as important for when we perform all of our analyses with the data we collect. And so for addition and subtraction, make sure that you are rounding to the same decimal place as the least accurate number. And for example, if we have 13.214 plus 234.6 plus 7.0350 plus 6.38, your calculator or the code that you write will spit out 261.2290. But for this problem, the correct number of significant digits goes out to the tenth decimal place because that is the least accurate number that's represented in 234.6. For multiplication and division, round to the appropriate number of significant digits. And for example, if we have 16.235 times 0 0.217 times 5, your calculator or your code will spit out 17.614975. But the appropriate number of significant figures here will be 1, and so therefore the correct answer here is 20.